only tolerable with bitter sarcasm. March 1943. March is coming to an end. I'm with my comrades again. Much has happened in the regiment, and my unit has also changed in its companies. I've landed in the second unit since my Rosinante is deployed there. We now have three platoons, plus the company troops. The tank distribution now looks as follows. First platoon consists of five Panzer III with the 50mm gun. Second platoon has five Panzer III, but with the 75mm gun. Third platoon has five Panzer IV with the long-barreled 75mm gun. So far, that's all alright since we're somehow stuck here in and around Konstantinovka. Next to us, infantry divisions have been inserted, which have fortified themselves in order to deny the Russian a breakthrough. Regardless, not everything is nice when one returns. The fear that old comrades are gone, either wounded or forever, is always there. Missing from my tank are the loader and the radio operator. Both were seriously injured outside of the tank during a mortar barrage. Lieutenant is also gone, reassigned back to the Reich since he's likely to take over a new Panzer V there. We've already heard quite a bit about these, and since he's really a capable man, he'll surely be able to master this new miracle creation of technology as well. Schmidt is still around. The Sarge also remains faithful to the bunch. But these two have also been impacted. Sarge received a piece of shrapnel from a grenade in the leg, and now limps a little bit but does not want to go home. Things won't run here without him. And Schmidt is carrying the arm in a sling, a grazing shot from a sniper, he tells me. Funny, everyone is always grinning when he tells that. I don't know yet why, but I'll still find out for sure. I'm being assigned to my Rosinante again, because the company chief wants to mix up the new and the old crews. He certainly does not like to split crews up, but success is what counts, and especially the Greenhorns always need an experienced man inside the tank. Senior Ensign Krugstein becomes my new commander. The driver is also a familiar face, Heinz. Radio operator as well as loader are new, new to the tank, but also have been with it for a few months. Talk over the routines inside the tank, and one quickly notices that we're all no beginners anymore. Only the senior ensign seems to be somewhat very green. He's already participated in several assaults, but this is his first on command. Oh well, we shall see. While he does not leave an arrogant impression, he does appear a little condescending to me. Be it as it may, in battle, the true face of a fighter shows itself, and it'll work out all right. Commanders are called in for a situational conference because in two days it's going against an assembly of Russian artillery, which is making life difficult for us in the divisional sector. After the meeting, Schmidt stops by again for a little chat and tells me what he'd overheard during the situational meeting. The old man had instilled in all commanders, especially the new ones, to listen to the old tank gunners, because those knew what's going on and that was usually a guarantee for success. Senior Ensign had then spoken up whether he'd now really need to listen to a non-commissioned officer, upon which there'd immediately been a verbal slap on the cheek for the snob, remarked Schmidt. The old man had then read him his rights and said very clearly that he could count himself lucky to have one of the best gunners of the company. Probably won't like this dressing down, but it was probably necessary well then, cheers. I'll keep quiet for now. The next day is full of preparations for the attack. At least one has some quiet here and is able to move around freely. The weather is already slightly spring-like, but the mud, with the thawed-out ground, is simply becoming worse and worse. A few days of sun would really help. Despite my joy being back with my unit, the mood is always somehow depressed. The tragedy of Stalingrad still lingers for many. Like a thorn in the flesh of our army that's constantly hurting, one has to keep thinking about it. In the conversations with comrades, a lot of disbelief can be heard that it had come to this. But I always think that we're not viewing over the grand scheme of things but can only see a small portion 
of the front. The retreat has also been a heavy cross that we all had to bear. Surely, we hadn't been able to continue defending positions and areas when the opponent was already standing in the flank, but nevertheless, to reverse gear was not easy to stomach, especially for us tank men. But I also hear optimism in the new weapons and also that soon the Russian won't be able to stand up to us anymore. With the masses of soldiers he'd already lost, there simply couldn't be that many more. What does worry me are the ever more appearing Anglo-American vehicles and tanks. While the tanks of the Americans are easy to knock out, but when more and more of them keep showing up, it'll also get hairy at some time. Nevertheless, now first of all, Rosinante is made ready for tomorrow. The senior ensign is issuing final orders. We're setting up the corners inside the tank as fits the best. And I'm waiting to see whether senior ensign Krugstein still wants to discuss anything with me. That then happens the next morning, close to an hour before we move out. He takes me aside and asks for a few minutes. I've just made some coffee. Together we're drinking the black stew. I'm waiting. Carefully he begins with how I'd see the coming assault and what I'd consider the right way. I explain that cautious but decisive would be the best mix. Not at all cost and not every opportunity should be taken right away because it could always be that the cost would be too great. Thoughtfully, he nods and then wants to know how I'd handled it with my other commanders. I tell that the commander had always focused on the overall situation and I was usually able to pick my targets myself. Only if he'd placed his hand on my shoulder, I was supposed to wait. That actually had always seemed like a good mix of autonomous responsibility and order. The senior ensign hesitates. Certainly he wants to prove himself, but of course, he also has to accept that we old hands know our way around better. All right, he remarks to me, let's see whether it'll work out that way. Starting, we're rolling with 10 vehicles into the area of assault, with two Panzer IV, five Panzer III, and three armored personnel carriers with infantry soldiers. We're driving in the lead, but we have almost 20 kilometers of approach ahead of us. Therefore, I hope nothing breaks down. The reconnaissance has reported several artillery emplacements, which have caused heavy damage in the area of the division. I can't imagine that these areas are unsecured. And as I've already explained to the commander, there are probably Russian anti-tank guns massed on site. We passed the forward post located five kilometers in front of our city. Now we're in no man's land. Tediously, the tracks are forcing their way over the worn out roadways because of which the driver suggests to rather drive off the road since the ground was better there. We turn off and indeed, it's going ahead much better there than on the road. After 12 kilometers, we make a stop, fan out and wait. A stork airplane is circling above us, but no alert is coming. That means there's no enemy in front of us yet to be seen from the air. Therefore, move on as planned, I think, another three kilometers, then it'll start. Speaking of the devil, Russian artillery is starting to spit so, somewhere there must be an observer and reported our advance over radio. On the main road there is hardly a tree or bush to be seen, only two Russian houses. The commander states that the observer might be sitting there and orders to open fire on the huts. Not to my liking, but, oh well. High explosive shell loaded, shooting stop, and after two shots, the Russian huts are burning. Apparently there are no civilians inside anymore. I can see movement through the optic two figures are hustling away. Soldiers, remarks the commander, and we fire another two shots. One appears to remain uninjured and disappears into a depression. The other remains lying down. The artillery fire is gradually subsiding, and I think the senior ensign was probably right. On it goes. Over radio, the order arrives to fan out and use extreme caution. But so far nothing has happened. Ever closer, we're coming toward a small town, which is situated near a patch of woods. It seems like the calm before the storm, but already we're receiving fire. 
The armored personnel carriers are breaking away to the left and right. Russian anti-tank guns are taking up the firefight against us, but they don't seem to be quite with it. I've now counted four flashes and report this to the senior ensign. A high explosive shell is already loaded, and since I don't have a hand on my shoulder, I take aim at the first suspected position. Fire, impact, and the anti-tank gun is flying up in the air, out of its camouflage. That was spot on, so I still know how to do it. I aim to the left, but suddenly have a hand up on my shoulder. All right, then wait up for now. The old man yells that he can't see an anti-tank gun. I shout back that I knew where it was sitting. I had seen the muzzle flash. Keep waiting, he remarks, but already the anti-tank fires again. Hits a Panzer III which sits smoking immobilized. Right there in front is the dirty dog, I yell. Hold your fire, remarks Krugstein. Damn it, what are we waiting for? Seconds run by and another impact is making the tank of our comrades offset behind us shake. I have to shoot, but I'm supposed to wait. Damn it. What are we waiting for here? The Holy Spirit. Again, there's a flash, and this time it slams the ground to the left of us. Shrapnel and dirt are flung against our Rosinante. The tank rocks. I yell into the radio that I've acquired the anti-tank gun in the crosshair. Finally, the command of fire is given, and in a fireball it tears the ammunition and the anti-tank gun to a thousand shreds. The other tanks are now firing at the row of trees, and after a few minutes the nightmare is over. No more anti-tank guns, we only receive infantry fire. On it goes. We leave the two knocked out tanks behind, with them a few grenadiers a rear guard, to rolling through the anti-tank gun emplacement, the radio operator has orders to shoot at anything by the anti-tank guns that's still moving. Not that a Russian, playing dead, might slip us an egg into the nest we're rolling through the town and the small patch of wood. In a clearing, the artillery pieces of the Russians are sitting, at least 40 pieces with trucks and tents. They've made themselves quite comfortable here apparently, everything underneath camouflage netting, no wonder that the Air Force hadn't been able to spot them. So, let's get to it. The Russians are becoming panicked and running about wildly. Some are attacking and attempting to engage us with the artillery pieces. For this, they need to be cranked down completely, but most of them don't manage that. With concentrated firepower, our machine guns and tank cannons hammer into the scared-up Russians. There's a hellish noise all around us, Ivan hasn't got a chance. The Russians are falling like flies, and we're destroying everything that moves. No hand on my shoulder, therefore I seek out the targets myself. I blow up one ammunition truck after another. The shock waves and shrapnel destroy entire flocks of Russians. And it's a wild mix-up of dying soldiers and exploding material. To the right next to us sits another Panzer IV long and fires into the right flank of the Russian position. Suddenly, our tank is shaken through and through. A giant boom goes through the tank. I'm startled, but that wasn't an anti-tank gun hit. Over radio, I hear that the right tank has suffered a direct impact. The turret blew off and slammed into our Rosinante. I notice right away what's going on. Our turret is jammed. I can't bring the gun on target. Crap. What am I supposed to do now? Frantically, the senior ensign shouts to me that we have to back immediately. I shout back that we can't leave here. We first have to find out who knocked out the tank next to us. We have to get close to our comrade's tank and use it for cover. The shelling had probably come from the right. Rosinante takes a jolt forward and we push ourselves to the wreck of the destroyed tank. Our gun barrel points over the chassis and the commander has spotted the opponent. Two T-34 are sitting at the edge of the woods and are firing at us. We can't aim in anymore, so I shout out to Heinz he'd have to turn the tank. The commander still thinks we should go back. I pull down my headset and turn around. Quite loudly, I explain to the senior ensign. 
that we'd have to bring the entire tank on target and engage the two crooks or they'd do us all in. He's not thrilled about the lecture but doesn't say anything else. I give Heinz orders, and already another shell of the T-34 hammers into the comrade tank. The Russian is now trying to hit us, but now it's our turn. I have the armor-piercing shell in the chamber and shout to Heinz. A bit further, just a bit more, and ever closer, both to the 34 moving to my optic. I fire too far left. Back up a little, Heinz. He rocks back slightly, and the loader has another shell in the chamber. I send off the shell and hit the one T-34 in the chassis, which thereupon starts to smoke. The second T-34 disappears backwards into the smoke. The Panzer III send a few more greetings after it. The nightmare is over. Only dead and wounded Russians. As far as the eye can see, we climb out of the tank and take a look at the steel grave of our comrades. The commander, Sergeant Ungert, is hanging torn in half in our track. When hit, it had apparently flung him outside. Radio operator and driver's hatch are open. Sitting inside are still the charred corpses. The turret is lying upside down in the field. Loader and gunner, or what's recognizable of them as humans, are hanging inside the turret and partially still inside the hull. Apparently the T-34 had hit them dead on in the side, and the ammo rack exploded. Terrible. But I believe they didn't suffer. There was a flash, and then over we gather the dead as best as we can, and wait for the trucks of the supply train. Heinz is standing next to me and remarks, Well, Rudolph, finally back to the front, right? Probably missed the stuff. This one can't get enough of shaking his head. He walk off. It's the only way one is able to stomach all this.